Well, if you would, please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Amos. If you find Daniel, you're getting in the, the right region. Daniel, Hosea, Jonah, or Joel, and then Amos. As we began our study of the Minor Prophets, it was just a reminder that as we look at the Minor Prophets, we understand that God has a plan, and that plan uh, has never been something that God has had to change uh, in the sense of His provision, because God's character remains the same. I think that's one of the most important tenets for us to understand throughout Scripture. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And another part of this is to understand then if that is God and he remains the same, okay, not just throughout the, the time period that all of the scriptures both occurred and were written, but also to understand that even today he remains the same. That reminds us that it's by God's standard that we must be reconciled. It's unto God. We're not adjusting God to us. Now, many people do that to suit their own desires, to suit their own choices, their own lifestyle pursuits. But it doesn't change the truth and the facts. That there is absolute truth and God is that truth. The Mount of Prophets, as they cover this history that we have of, of essentially about a 400-year period that occurs prior to the 400-ish period in between the Testaments. So essentially you're looking at about 800 years prior to the coming of Christ and in that period, we see how the, the nations or the children of Israel, as they had been split, are coming to grips with the fact that despite the fact that God had chosen them as, in a sense, a vehicle to show who He is, His truth, His law, and His righteous requirements, that that did not mean that there was a stamp of approval upon them ethnically because He still demanded and required obedience. And that's one of the things that we see here in Amos. We see that God is absolutely coming against other nations that have come against Israel and Judah. Essentially enemies of God's people. And yet, God also calls them to an account, Judah and Israel. So it's never been simply by the selection of a people that would put a people in good standing. It's always been that as God moves among the hearts of the people, that their response to his initiative is obedience. And so basically one of the most important things that we can understand as we connect the Old and the New Testaments is this, that covenant promises are for those who keep those promises. Now, please don't misconstrue or misunderstand. I'm not saying that we have to perform in order to be saved. I'm saying that the mark of those who have truly been brought into a covenant promise with God are those who show signs of having been called by God, having been saved by God. Because Scripture makes very, very clear that the covenant promises made to Abraham were actually made with one seed, not with a bunch of people. It was made ultimately with Christ. And Christ is the only one who was able to keep what God demanded of people to be acceptable to God. So therefore, anyone who is in the covenant promises of God are only those who trust that Christ kept those promises on their behalf. It is impossible to receive the covenant promises of God apart from Christ. And that does not matter what your ethnicity, and, it, and it, even the minor prophets, and especially here in Amos, it makes clear it doesn't even matter if you're Jewish. Because the judgment for the Jews was the same as it was going to be for the Ammonites. And for those who worship the Baals, it was going to be the same unless they trusted God to provide for them what was necessary in the covenant 
so they could be part of his people. Guys, this is part of the mystery of the New Testament that Paul gives us in Romans. Whether you read Romans 3 or Romans 9 through 11, part of the mystery is this, is that we understand that that covenant people is inclusive of Jew and Gentile. And Paul himself says, not all Israel is true Israel. And what he means by that is simply this. It's only the Jews who trust in Christ to be their covenant keeper that, have, that can receive the promises that he made. But it also, and part of the mystery is, it's not just for the Jews who believe in this promise. It's also for the Gentiles. And that was news to Gentiles and that was news to Jews. Because all this time they had misinterpreted and been taught wrongly about what it meant to be God's people. That's part of the backdrop of what's going on here. In Amos, during this time period, which happened very early on in the course of this history, probably around 750 BC, the Jews believed that because God's selection of them as a people, as his vehicle to show forth his promises to the world, his offering of salvation to the world, they believed because God selected them in that way, there was really nothing they could do wrong. And they were susceptible then to when things were going well or better and there was times of pro uh, prominence, even if they were to allow the adoption of false practices that because God had picked them, they were just fine. And Amos is bringing a message that could get him killed because he's saying that's not the case, nor has it ever been the case. You are not okay just because God chose to work through you. It is required of you to follow him. And what we're going to see in our text today is some of the detail of the issue that God has with his people. And I think in it we will find perhaps some description of the error and the sin that we ourselves fall prey to. Because ultimately, this is what we see with the children of Israel. That as God deals with Israel and as he exposes their sin, it is essentially an exposure of the sins of humanity. It's just here we can have specifics. But for us, the context may be a little different, but it's still at the core is the same. It's a twofold rejection of God. And we've talked about this before, according to Jeremiah 2, 9-13. It is first and foremost a rejection that God is the fountain of living waters, that he alone satisfies. That's one side of the coin of our sin. The other side of the coin of our sin is we then try to replace him with something else, something else that was never designed to satisfy, and yet we keep trying. And that could be relationships, it could be jobs, it could be uh, greed, the pursuit of materialism, it could be lust, pornography, it could be any number of things that we are trying to pursue to give us some kind of momentary happiness or satisfaction, but it never remains. This is why addiction occurs, because you keep having to string together these satisfying experiences, and yet they only leave you more and more empty. All of that is an expression of all that we try to do to replace what only God can do for us to be enough. In Amos 1 and 2, when we looked at it, it makes clear that God has issue because everyone's sinners. Everyone is a sinner. Romans 3.23 makes it clear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All, all the nations. And that's exclusive of none, including Judah and Israel. And as we're going to look today at, at Amos 3 and 4, that we understand that because everyone is a sinner, we then are all guilty in need of God's mercy. I mean, I get it. It's not the most positive title for a, a message, all are guilty. I mean, that doesn't sound like, I, I'm kind of glad we don't really publicize these, you know, out on the billboard all that much. Hey, come to church Sunday, everyone's guilty. But it is the truth. Because everyone's a sinner, everyone is guilty before God. So what do we do about it? And let me remind you that as as Amos is testifying to the northern kingdom, which is Israel, and Samaria would be the capital of that kingdom, that in the south you have Judah, which really he is closer to in proximity, but he's one of only two of the minor prophets that actually addresses specifically the northern kingdom as far as prophesying against them. 
And in this course, again, it's representative of what God is going to do with all the people. For, for instance, even though Assyria is coming and the south kingdom of Judah will be spared-ish, Babylon then will be knocking at the door and everyone, both Israel and Judah, will be held captive. Judgment is coming because all are guilty. What we talked about last week is that God sees and knows everything about everyone and no one goes unseen. We all are seen. But let me also remind you as a bit of a spoiler, in Amos 9, 11, and 12, it says, In that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. And of course, he's talking about in the line of David, he's speaking no less of the coming of Christ who is in the line of David and who will reign and does reign forever. But one thing I want you to make to understand in light of what's going on in Amos out of chapter, when I read this in chapter nine, I read this because of not just it pointing to Christ, but I want to focus on this idea of remnant because the idea of remnant is not simply that God always just kind of has a group of people that are his that he chose. They are people that are faithful The remnant of God have always been those that have trusted and believed in God to keep his covenant promises. They are not a remnant because of a particular ethnicity or a geographic location. They are a remnant because they are, quote, those who are called by my name and, quote, of all the nations. See, this has always been the interpretation. And yet, even when Paul would then come some 800 years later, and give this same testimony to the church in Rome, it was still yet a mystery. Eight centuries later, they still weren't interpreting what it meant to be remnant, what it meant to be called by his name, what it meant for all the nations to be included. So first of all, God speaks. Look at chapter 3. Hear this word, That the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, northern kingdom, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. Now, that certainly would then loop in and include even those who are in Judah. He says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. I mean, right out of the gate, he makes clear. I did choose you. You are the ones that I have chosen to make clear what my expectations are of the world of the nations. You are the ones that I've chosen to put the promises through, to give the words of the prophets through. Yes. And he doesn't say that makes you safe. He says, therefore, (laughs) I will punish you for all your iniquities. Right out of the gate, he rips out that presupposed idea that, hey, because God has worked through us and he knows us, we're okay. And they are so not okay. He says, the two walk together unless they have agreed to meet. And he goes on these series of questions, rhetorical, but speaking of a truth. Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Here's the thing about lions. Lions don't roar to give a warning to their prey. Actually, when they see their prey, they they roar. And in their roaring, it's just this, it's basically a deer in a headlights kind of thing that goes on they freeze because the lion has seen it and they freeze and it's actually part of the strategy of a lion so God is saying I'm speaking freeze stop where you are you are before me and this is not going to go well does a young lion cry out from his den if he has taken nothing Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth when there is no trap for it? Does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? 
For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? And then he goes on and says this. Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod and to the strongholds in the land of Egypt. Now these are warring factions. These are definitely godless societies, but he is actually summoning them to observe what he's about to do. He says, and say, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria. Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, Israel, was on a hill. There were a lot of hills around, but it seemed to have kind of the peak. And he said, bring these godless nations to that hill to watch what's going to go on around them in the valleys. And see the great tumults within her and the oppressed in her midst. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord. Those who store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. Therefore, says the Lord God, an adversary shall surround the land and bring down your defenses from you and your stronghold shall be plundered. So he's prophesying, even though not declaring the name of Assyria that's coming, he is saying Assyria is coming. And this is God's form of judgment to his people that essentially are doing this. They are abusing their power and their wealth at the cost of those who are least fortunate. They're trampling over those who are poor and needy and widows in their midst, their own kind, for the sake of acquiring more. We spoke of this last week. One of the issues with Amos that he addresses so clearly is this idea of injustice, how it represents how a person sees a person, which also then represents how a person sees God creator. If you see someone as less than human, you will treat them unjustly. You, it's, whether that's based on race, ethnicity, socioeconomic, whatever. That is indicative of how we see God as creator in his image when we treat others with injustice. He is not saying your way of salvation is by doing then justice. He is saying justice or rather injustice is an indicator that you do not know God. And what he's doing is he's addressing it almost in a reverse engineering kind of way. He is addressing what is most obvious. And here's how we know it's most obvious. Even the godless nations of Ashdod and Egypt are gathering on the mount in Samaria and they can simply look and go, oh, they're oppressing one another. Even the godless nations can see the problem with the issue. But the children of Israel are so in the midst of it for their own greed and their own sake, they don't even see their own sin. But part of it too is to, rem is to remind all of the nations that it's up against God's standard that we are judged. So as we see this and as God speaks, we see that crime and punishment do go together. If there is some kind of injustice, God is going to see it and God is going to deal with it. And even these other nations are gathering so that they can even look upon it and see what judgment was happening and why. The guilt of Israel is representative of the guilt of all of God's people. They had forsaken going after God. They were seeing others as less than human, as less than themselves. And all of this is in the backdrop of having plenty. We all have a tendency to get lazy when everything goes well and we have seemingly enough. So what does God do? Well, in the midst of this, and in the midst of these promises, he then promises that justice is coming. Look at verse 12. This little narrative aside in verse 12 is, is really, really significant. Thus says the Lord, as the shepherd rescues from the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch and a part of a bed. Man, I mean, look, again, Amos is a shepherd from Tekoa, okay? And we cannot gauge professions on, you know, how smart, 
how literary, but the dude has some serious literary chops. I mean, this is both beautiful and terrifying. I mean, think about what it's saying. He says, a shepherd from the mouth of a lion, he ain't getting the whole, he ain't getting the whole sheep back. He's just grabbing what he can, and out of it only comes parts. It doesn't turn out well for the sheep. But then he gets really explicit. He talks about a piece of an ear, two legs. So shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria. Again, the capital of the northern kingdom. Basically, there's not going to be much left. Now, when we talk about remnant, this, does not, this is not a violent, less gathering of the remnant. This is filled with tragedy, with difficulty, and yes, with violence. There just won't be much left. And he goes on in verse 13, hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts, that on the day I punish Israel for her transgressions, I will punish the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I will strike the winter house along with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. What God has seen in the practices of injustice that is showing that they are giving no consideration for God having created all of the people and that God has a plan for the people. They are looking for themselves, looking out for themselves and building up their own wealth and their own prosperity at the expense of others. He says, as this justice comes, you need to understand something, that he is going to be total and complete when he brings this justice. See, Bethel was a border city between Israel and Judah. Jeroboam of the south had set one of his idols there. So even though Bethel does have, in a sense, it also has a a, a history where there's a reminder of God's faithful presence. It's also a reminder at this stage in Israel's history of a place where the division between faithfulness to God and the faithfulness to self began when Jeroboam and Rehoboam had split the kingdoms after Solomon and Jeroboam decided for the sake of capitalism, in a sense, for the sake of basically a dollar or a dime, he set up because he saw in the region that idol worship and all of its kind of extravagant uh, outworkings would bring in more money, which in his mind practically meant more benefit. More benefit for the community, more benefit here, there. It's just a reminder once again, guys, that how we go about things matters. If you think the end justifies the means, go back to Scripture. And I would even encourage you to consider this even politically. It does not because God will absolutely judge those who might have a good self-serving means in this world, but if they go about it in a way that is God-defying, judgment is coming. The judgment of God will be public. It will be humiliating. It will be at the hands of enemies. The nations have been summoned to watch what's going to happen. And Assyria then, when it comes in, will be seen by the Ashdods and the Egypts of the world as their enemies are then plundered without them even having to lift a finger. Because God has issue with his own. The charge was not against even wealth itself, per se. Look at again what he says here. So he deals with this idea of there's false worship going on. He's going to deal with that. But he's also going to come against how they have then appropriated and acquired their wealth. In verse 15, I will strike the winter house along with the summer house. Now, I want to be careful because some of you have two houses. You have a winter house and you have a summer house. Okay, so don't extrapolate this too much. Okay, I mean, if it applies, I can't do anything about it. But the, the, the idea here is that what he's saying is, and actually we, we have archaeological evidence of the ivory that was discovered in this region. They established extravagant homes for both the summer and the winter, but it was at the expense. Basically, the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. And it was at the expense of the rich that they were doing so. And they were doing so basically still using God's name, but using false worship to do it, to acquire to get more funds. He says, these great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. The lion is roaring. He said his peace. 
It's inescapable. So again, injustice reveals how one sees God as creator and redeemer. Because basically, if you see others as less than yourself, you either see them as unredeemable or not even to bother. And you feel like that God might owe you something. And whether this is because ethnically, uh, from their perspective, they, are, they think they're God's chosen people in, in the sense of the most broad, in the broadest sense of ethnic terms, they think they're God's chosen people as opposed to what God is focused on, though, is the remnant of those who keep covenant promise with him. It reveals one's relationship to God. How do you see others? Are you willing to trample over others in order to gain what you think is best for you and yours? And again, it's not about social gospel, social justice in a sense that goes further. It simply is this idea of social injustice is indicative of what you see is necessary for a person to know God. And if you are able to see any other person anywhere of any ethnicity, even Palestinian, in the midst of all that's going on, if you see them as less than those that God is able to redeem, then you are guilty of thinking that you yourself do not need quite the redemption that others just might. See, all of this flows out of the character of God. That's why we said at the beginning, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. Look, I don't know what's going on with the women. And I'm glad this is what scripture says and not me, because Amos is throwing it all down. And he's saying, you women who are acting like this and gathering for yourself, whatever these goods are, whatever the perspective is, it was indicative of the injustice and the... Uh, the demeaning view of the oppressed and those around and the idea of being a cow of Bashan there were actually two kinds there were kind of civilized kind that would just graze and there were also wild cows didn't know this till I studied it okay they were aggressive I don't know what that looks like if you probably you haven't but uh, my family's read this wonderful series by a friend, Andrew Peterson, called The Wingfeather Saga. They have these, these things called toothy cows, and they're very aggressive, mean-spirited cows. And so maybe if you read that, you would get an idea of what the wild cows of Bastion are like. So, yes, a high recommendation. I would encourage you to read it, get everything of his. They are on the mountain of Samaria. They're actually just simply consuming all of the goods around them at the expense of others. So he's isolating something that's basically just so obvious to the community. But then he goes on, the Lord God has sworn by his what? Holiness. His character. God does not have to pick and choose what sin is going to be an issue. It is anything that is contrary to the holy nature of God that is justly deserving of judgment. For all have sinned and fall short of the what? The glory of God. Guys, this is why even as Christians, we do not get the privilege of isolating particular sins that we really have issue with. There are so many lists in the New Testament that if we just will read them long enough, you will find yourself there. You know, it might go on, there's the adulterer, there's the idolater, there's the fornicator, I'm, I'm good to go. There's the, there's the proud and the angry and the rats. It's against the holiness of God. And any time that you compare yourself to a particular pet sin that you have a particular issue with, you are right in that moment not looking at the right standard. God calls out on his holiness and his holiness alone. And that means that's the only standard by which any person of any nation could ever be approved. Have you met that standard? Have I met that standard? No. But there was one that did for me. In Christ, there was no sin, no guile. 
He lived by the standard of God's holiness and satisfied it fully, completely, thoroughly, even in thought, not just deed. And part of God's holiness is the punishment of sin. So that had to be done. And that's exactly what Christ did at the end of his life. He took on an unjust death for himself, but that was just for us had we been there. And that's what we remember when we take communion, which we'll do in a few moments. It's a display of God's character for him to address the guilty and to show them that judgment is just and deserved. He sworn by his holiness that behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take away you with take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks, and you shall go out through the breaches, each one straight ahead, and you shall be cast out into Harmon, declares the Lord. Now look at this. He says, Come to Bethel. Remember, he's already addressed it here, and he said, I'm gonna deal with what's going on in Bethel. There are altars there. So he says, Come to Bethel. And transgress to Gilgal and multiply transgression. You say, well, what's that? Well, look at what he's talking about. He said he's going to destroy the altar. This isn't necessarily, it could still be a false idol altar, but it also could be an altar they intended to still give basically a nod to God. But they're doing it via false worship kind of ways. Listen to what he says. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened and proclaim freewill offerings. Publish them for so you love to do, O people of Israel, declares the Lord. What's he saying? He's saying part of what he sees is they are simply going through the motions of worship. They're not even doing it by God's standard and details. He didn't say come every three days. He certainly didn't say come and bring leavened bread. They're not paying attention to the details. They're just going through the motions to assuage their conscience. They are slapping the Christian symbol on something that is otherwise godless. And guys, if you don't think that we have celebrities politicians and others that will leverage God for the sake of you feeling like you can support them. Oh, you are fooled and tricked. If you are of the mind, and I'll be daring in saying this, it is horrific the things that are going on in the Middle East. Horrific. But we are not to just blindly support in this sense, we, we should support Israel as, as allies, absolutely, as we would Europe, as we would Great Britain, absolutely. But we should not extrapolate some false view of what it means to be God's chosen people to think that every single thing that they do as an ally is right. We should still, as a country, hold them accountable to some of the injustices that might very well be going on as far as it, even, even if Hamas, and they are, they are using human shields. It is vile. It is awful. It is tragic and it is demonic. But we also should desire for even the innocents, even if they believe differently than we do, falsely even, families and children in Palestine that are suffering as a result of bombings, we should still want that to not be the case. And that doesn't mean we're against Israel. It doesn't mean we're pro-Palestine. It just simply means this. We should not say that because a person is a Jew or because they're Israelites, that means that they're absolutely unequivocally doing what God wants. It is God's covenant people. And God's covenant people are those who believe in the covenant keeper, and that is Christ. God's covenant keeping one day for the new Jerusalem is going to be all nations everywhere, only of those who have come to Christ. Jew and Greek alike. If you don't like what I'm saying, go read Paul. It is only those who come to Christ that get the covenant promises. You don't get to break covenant and get the promises that come as a result. That is unbiblical. It's un Amos. It's un Paul. It's un Romans. It's un Colossians. It's un Galatians. It is only those who trust in God's covenant keeping power that He's provided to get the covenant promises of God. And that is those who come to Christ.
this abuse of prosperity, this abuse of worship going through the motions, God is seeing what's going on and it is not okay. So think about it. They're trying to make heaven on earth. They have ceased to trust by faith God and his promises for his people. And so what they've done in that anxiety, in that impatience, they have then gone for themselves and they've acquired wealth thinking, hey, as long as we have more money, as long as more stuff is coming in, that's good for our people, right? So let's do that, whatever it takes. We're God's people, that's going to be good for us. I wonder how often that's happening in our thinking, even as Western evangelicals. Who do we step over? Who do we think about that we don't give a rip about when it comes to our politics or our economics just for the sake of us doing better? Are we stepping over the oppressed and therefore showing that we are not thinking of God rightly? God has issue with that. But it's not just all bad news because what we see in verse 6 is, he says, I gave you cleanness of teeth. In all your cities, okay, I know that probably lacks a little bit of bite, so to speak, ha ha, um, but it, 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 it is indicative of what it would mean to be given plenty. He says, and lack of bread in all your places, yet you did not return me. He's not actually saying clean teeth is a good thing. He's saying they were without food. He says, I also withheld the rain from you. So there was drought when you were yet three months to the harvest. I would send rain on one city and send no rain on another city. One field would have rain and the field on which it did not rain would wither. So two or three cities would wander to another city to drink water and would not be satisfied. Yet you did not return to me. What's he saying? I've given you warning after warning after warning and you're not responding to what I'm saying. God alone satisfies I mean, look, no one can say it for you, I I guess, for the most part. We can't do that for one another. But before God and his word and the powerful working of the Holy Spirit in prayer, let me ask you, have there been some warnings again and again and again that God has brought before you that you, if you were to stop, would realize, I need to be careful here. God really has been trying to get my attention. Look, I've had so many physical issues since I've lived here and and still in the midst of so much that I I just, it's, I I don't want to whine about it. So I don't want to, I don't like talking about it. I don't, unless I have an actual diagnosis, you're not going to hear much about anything. And I've had some of those, but guys, I have to stop and look and say, look, God, are you getting my attention for something? That's not to be overly mystical about every little thing that happens. It doesn't make me a fatalist. But it does simply mean that, look, Scripture does say that there are things that happen, even when we talk about the Lord's table. If there are sins that are unconfessed, look, Paul says to the Corinthian church, some of you are sick because you are harboring unrepentant sin. I think that's still good today, as wild and crazy as that sounds. I mean, I'll sometimes joke with staff or others and say, look, when we're taking the Lord's table, you better not sneeze or cough. I'll call you out. That's not what we do. But guys, we do need to think about what are some of these interruptions that are going on. Certainly God is calling us to himself, but is he also perhaps getting our attention about some things that, we've gone, that have gone unaddressed? And the only way to know it is if you're persisting in what you know to be sin, even though you are facing barrier after barrier, Roadblock after roadblock. God is warning them that, look, I've set up all of these and you're just not paying attention to them. But he does go on. He says, I struck you with blight and mildew. Of course, that goes over the crops. Go on down to verse 10. I sent among you pestilence after the manner of Egypt. You think about that, the exodus, there were locusts. He sent locusts to destroy their crops. They still weren't paying attention. They were just writing it off as something else. In verse 11, I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 12, he says, Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God. Yeah, wow. Prepare to meet your God. But you know what would be worse? God just leaving them alone. 
indifference. God is in the business of restoration to those that he calls to himself. And because of our bullheadedness and our sin, he is still faithful and loving to even throw some serious roadblocks in our way to get our attention to our need to go back to him as the only one who can satisfy us, to turn away from sin, of replacing him with other things that were never designed to be him. Verse 13, for behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind. Let's start with creation. He is the creator of the cosmos. He, and declares to man what is his thought. What a gracious condensation. <laughs> Not the condensation. Condescension for the God of the cosmos to speak to his creation. Who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Is he the same? Absolutely. Is he punishing and judging for the hope of restoration of some? Yes. But this has to be applied to all because why? The standard is God's holiness. We are being reconciled to God, not on any other basis. So therefore, all sin, since all are guilty, all sin must be judged. In Romans 2, starting in verse 4, you don't have to turn there, just listen. He says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Guys, he is speaking to Jew and Gentile believer or professing believer in the church of Rome. And I think in particular, he's speaking to the Jewish believer, thinking that they're in good standing and they're doing okay. They're making the same mistake that the people made back in Amos day. And he's saying, you're also going to experience the wrath of God's judgment as all the nations will that reject him. Do not presume that you're in good standing based on who you think you are. He will render to each one, each one, according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. So they're showing the fruit of repentance and righteousness. Verse 8, but for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury, Jew and Greek alike. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. So clearly when he says first, he's not saying primacy. He's just simply saying that they should be aware of what God's doing. Because to them were given the prophets and the word of God and the laws. See, in Revelation 19, 15 and 16, it says, From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And that's his version, not crazy versions that we see in our area. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Again, that's the standard by which he judges. That's the standard by which he executes his judgment, because that is the standard by which we must be approved before God. His name. Just as our section ends, it is the Lord, the God of hosts. That is his name. So church, we have to ask ourselves, has God ceased to be holy? Is he the same? Do we believe that he is the same yesterday, during Amos time, today, and forever? If it is yes, then the holy standard remains. And for those of us who reject Christ as the only provided standard, the judgment remains on our heads for a day to come. But if you have trusted that Christ performed that standard, perfectly satisfying God's holy requirements, that he also bore the wrath of God that should be poured out on us because we have sinned, 
but he poured it out on his son instead on the cross. If you believe that is for you in your place condemned, he stood. Then you can know this as surely as he said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. He looks upon you, Christian, and he sees Christ, the hope of glory, and says that you, because Christ is in you, you are also acceptable to him on his basis. But does that give you license and freedom to sin, to do the very things that are unjust? Of course not. So if you do find in your own life biases, uh, racism, or some kind of uh, injustice to and oppressing other people so, the fact, so, so that you can get ahead in the world or whatever, then you need to address that because God clearly comes against that strongly in the book of Amos. Let's not celebrate and revel in the very things that Christ died that we'd be delivered from. But non-Christian, I would say this, please understand this. There is no other standard by which you must be saved. It has to be based on God's standard as he revealed. If you think it's you, you are in danger of judgment that will come one day for you. And we're not a wild and crazy bunch. I know it sounds a little nutty, but it's true. All will be judged. And if Christ is in you, that judgment has already been born satisfied. And if Christ is not in you, then eternally you will be separated from him. And there will be torment and judgment for all the rest. Just as surely as he has not ceased to be holy, he has not ceased to be merciful. What he did once and for always that we remember here at the Lord's table is still good today. We do not re-crucify Jesus. What he did once and for always, because he rose from the grave means that there's no more sacrifice to be made. There's no other priest to be trusted in. There's no more go-between. Jesus is enough. And what he did once and for always, we simply remember and commemorate here for those who've experienced this. We don't do this again hoping it, it imparts some additional grace that has not already been given us in faith in Christ. We're just remembering. It's a kindness of God that in our weakness, he gives us something to see, to feel, to taste, to remind us of what faith is. But for the rest of you, I, I want to say, please don't misconstrue then, because there is nothing of feel, touch, or taste that can actually give you grace. It cannot actually impart to you saving power. So if you do not know Christ, if you have not trusted Christ alone to save you, please do not take these elements. Like we say regularly, it will confuse you because you'll be doing something like a religious rite, thinking it's giving you points. And that is not what this is for. And you do not need to add fuel to what Satan wants to do is to keep you confused and keep moving the shell around. You need to stop and realize no, my only hope is Christ and Christ only. Nothing that I've done, only all that he has done and all that he is.